Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight in our fifth and final webinar in the series on New Orleans music and art and special education. Tonight's topic, join the second line, adapting movements and mobility devices in the classroom. And before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few features of our Zoom, and then we'll dive right into the content. And I wanna thank you again for being here tonight. We're so glad you're here to learn with us. First up, we have the mute feature. If you could, please stay muted while the panelists are speaking. We are going to have so many amazing moments for participations and opportunities to ask questions. But if possible, please keep your microphone muted while the panelists are speaking. We also have the start video feature. We'd love to see everyone's faces from wherever you are. So there will be a moment for you to show your faces and join in if you choose. We also have the chat box feature. That is a great place for you to engage with the panelists, ask questions, and also see some of the resources that our guest Mary from Preservation Hall Foundation will be dropping in for you to save and access later. We also have the live transcript option that you can turn on. And you can expand your screen if you are on a desktop or laptop device. Okay, so now for a few stage introductions, this is your opportunity to turn your camera on and say hello to our community of learners here. I will start. Um, we have a chat box feature where you will be able to participate. But first, my name is Pam Blackman. I'm with the Preservation Hall Foundation. I am an African-American woman with black curly hair. I have a floral plant blouse on. In my background, you will see some abstract art. In this chat box, we'll ask your name, nickname, or stage name if you're an artist, the city that you represent, and the song that gets your body moving. So in the chat box, just throw in there your name and I'll start. My name is Pam. Some of my friends call me Jammy Pammy and I live here in New Orleans. And my song to get me moving is Happy by Pharrell. And welcome everyone. Next up, I'd like to introduce you to our ASL interpreter for the night, Ms. Laura Cicignano. You can pin Laura in the participants tab if you'd like. And next up, we'll introduce our panelists this evening. Uh, we have a, a really wonderful group of experienced um, music lovers, art lovers, educators with us tonight. Uh, we'll begin with Mr. Will Smith, who is a self-contained special education teacher and trumpeter at Preservation Hall. We have Meredith Sharp, a neurologic music therapist. Dr. Felicia Lively, a music education teacher and arts advocate. Melinda Ford, an instrumental music teacher and saxophonist. And we will let Mr. Will Smith take it away with our welcome. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us. I'm coming here from the Historic Preservation Hall, a place of not only such historical importance, but also very important to the music scene today. I am an African-American man. I have short mingled gray hair I'm wearing a blue and white plaid shirt. And I'm here tonight to enjoy and help to enlighten you all on all of the beautiful aspects of movement and music. 
So welcome. And we'll start by telling you our agenda for tonight. Tonight's agenda includes policy, advocacy, and representation, instrumental music, movement and the brain, general vocal music classrooms, an experiential, join the second line. We have a resources and strategies page, and at the end we'll have a Q&A where you can join in and pitch your questions to all the panelists. So right about now, I think Ms. Melinda Ford is gonna take us into the first part of our agenda, policy advocacy and representation. Take it away, Ms. Ford. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. My name is Melinda Ford and I am an African-American woman. I have a short teeny weeny Afro. I have on uh, a clear flame cat eye glasses and I have on a Kelly green shirt. I am here in my home in Maryland where I am sitting in my music studio. Without any further ado, I wanna ask you a question. Do you recognize anyone that is in this particular frame here? Anyone, any musician, artist on this particular picture that you can see? You could put it in the chat, it'd be great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for participating. I'm, I'm trying to read this chat over here. That's why you see my eyes over to the, to the right hand side. So um, I'm quite sure that it was easy to recognize some of the, the musicians, composers and artists that you know, you listen to throughout the years. But have you ever stopped to think if any one of these individuals had a disability or better yet a differing ability it's real easy to recognize persons in particular these musicians who have a physical disability with mr ray charles and mr matthew whitaker but the others you can't see so readily correct um can we please go to the to the next slide when you talk about famous musicians with differing abilities you're talking about um, in the first, on the left-hand side and left corner for the frame we just left, uh, Travis Meeks is a guitarist that has, that's on the autism spectrum. There's a band in Europe called the Autistics. In order to be a participant in the band, you have to be a musician and you have to have autism. Of course, we saw uh, Mr. Ray Charles, but Matthew Whitaker was the other uh, pianist that was in the, pers the slide right before it. But you know, as I was doing my research, I didn't know that Art Tatum, famous jazz pianist, was legally blind. When we hear musicians, we don't necessarily think of their different ability or their disability, right? And, and so when we hear the famous violinist Itzhak Perlman or David Sanborn, or when you look at Tony Braxton, the singer, you don't think disability. You hear the music that comes from their voice and the music that comes from their instrument. Because there are different abilities, of course, these individuals that you saw on the slide before, we had talked about autism, we had talked about blindness, we talked about physical disabilities, mental uh, illness uh, is considered a disability. Nina Simone, a famous singer, pianist, and activist. Um, when we say speech and language as a different ability, Adam Levine and Solange Knowles have ADHD and Jewel, as well as Tony Bennett, have dyslexia. Now, there are other uh, differing abilities that students have, but one thing that everyone has on both sides is their love of music. Can we go to the next slide? Music is one of those things that makes you part of the human community, correct? So, you know, it's wonderful to be able to participate as a musician or as a singer, whether it's professionally, amateurly, uh, amateurly or you're just learning, you love to sing in the church or, or temple, mosque, synagogue, or things of that nature. But being a musician or raising your voice in music is very, very, very important to the human race. So Melinda, why are you talking about advocacy or why is this slide on advocacy and what does that have to do with uh, adaptive movement, right? So um, adaptive movement is a large part of teaching students with differing abilities. 
and mobility devices is a large part of teaching students with differing abilities. So I wanted to talk about advocacy because um, if it were not for policies that were put in place over time, students with differing abilities would not have the opportunity to participate in education and in certain, in certain areas of life if it were not for legislation that went forth. So the Students with Disabilities Act idea and Section 504 prohibits discrimination uh, on the basis that of disability in programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance uh, from the U.S. Department of Education. What does that mean? That as long as um, students are participating in education, whether that's pre-K all the way up through college or from college on, um, the United States government helps to fund that system to ensure that there are uh, adequate teachers, adequate devices to help students learn, adequate books and textbooks for that. And it extends into the Americans with Disabilities Act and that went into, um, into law in the 1990s. So if it were not for the Civil Rights Act that came before all of this in 1965, we wouldn't have a lot of these particular laws, but this particular law is part of the civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals' disabilities in areas of public life, including jobs, schools, transportation, and all public and private places that are open to the general public. Now, of course, we wouldn't have to advocate for our students or for our neighbors or for our colleagues or for our children if it were not for discrimination. And what I like about this essay by Dr. Dafinia Lazaria Stewart is that Dr. Stewart um, adds a personification concept to these terms. So what are you saying, Melinda? For example, diversity asks who's in the room. In my case, in the band room, in the orchestra. And equity is going to respond who's trying to get into the room but cannot whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure. Now, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but when we're thinking about inclusion, a lot of the laws or the advocacy policies that we have in place um, make sure that students with differing abilities have the same opportunity to participate in general music and instrumental music classes and to be a part of the educational process in its totality. So when we're talking about inclusion, have every student's ideas been heard? Has everyone's uh, concepts and, and opinions actually been taken seriously? And Justice is going to respond here and it's going to say whose ideas w won't be taken seriously or as serious because they're not part of the majority. If I want my instrumental music program to go, especially after this year we've had in the pandemic, I need to make sure that all students are included in my program. And one of the great things about teaching in um, the United States, in particular in Maryland where I teach, is that before we actually get an opportunity to start teaching by law, we have to sit down. When I say we, teachers, all teachers, not just teachers of students with different, uh, differing abilities, but every teacher that's gonna come in contact with that student and we have to make time to understand each student's strengths so that we can teach to their strengths so that they can be successful. And if we want uh, music and music education to continue to go on, we have to make sure that we understand every student's um, uh, differing abilities and make sure that they have success. Why is this very important? Because representation matters. Now, when we think of students with differing abilities and disabilities, we didn't necessarily think of Tony Bennett or, or um, Ray Charles or uh, those other musicians, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who's on the autism spectrum. But I think it's very, very important that we, that we talk about that. Can we go to the next slide? I agree, I agree Melinda. I definitely agree. And I'm, I'm just hearing you and not only does um, it incite us to think about things, but what you're saying is there's an action step. And that action step for success in the music programs is to plan. So uh, Felicia, 
I would, I would love to hear why you feel that it's important to plan for disability representation in the music programs. I know Melinda said that where she, where she lives, it's required, but if it's not required, why is it just important to include planning in the process of building a music program? Well, now, um, I am Felicia Lively. Uh, I'm an African-American uh, female senior citizen. <laughs> I have a short curly do and I'm wearing a blue shirt, which looks like it looks like it has a, a paint splash on my left shoulder. I have big earrings on, so you won't miss me. At any rate, mm -hmm. um, uh, representation is uh, uh, being sure that all students are represented in the classroom is is a way to alleviate some discrimination um, and bring about that diversity, that equity that inclusion and, and of course, restorative justice. Now, um, at the classroom level, there are two ways to, uh, to include everyone. Uh, you create a social normalization uh, by the acceptance of students and their strengths in the process of teaching and learning. And of course, there are adjustments to the music curriculum to be sure that everyone is included. Now, uh, the music curricular objectives um, for, uh, for a lot of subjects have become secondary to the needs of students. We have to use our subject, or and in particular music, to help students feel good, um, good enough to want to listen to music concepts and to, to listen and learn. And in the case of differing abilities, we want to adapt um, our lessons to include their ability to participate. Uh, we want these lessons to uh, expose all of our neurodiverse children to the great legacy of American jazz, and in particular that of President Jean Paul of New Orleans, um, as well as the the uh, Afro, the African influenced genres of blues, uh, even country western. Uh, gospel, ragtime, rock, and uh, help kids understand that uh, uh, jazz is a part of their legacy. It is a classic, it is our classical music. Um, now, as we adapt our lessons, um, we have to understand the difference between adapting and modification. Understand that adapt adaptations are uh, where the learning income uh, outcomes are remain the same for the prescribed curriculum. That is, you create um, strategies so that a student with a differing ability can perform the learning outcome, but you don't change that learning outcome. You accept what they can do in the uh, in the process of learning that. Modifications, however, are where the outcomes are changed or substantially different from the prescribed curriculum, uh, the mainstream curriculum, so that it supports the students' needs, so it supports their development personally. Um, and please understand that adaptation is an error-driven process for the teacher. And it's for the teacher to discover uh, wh what best stu suits the students. Um, the st Adaptation should begin with the student's ability. Really observe what the student is able to do. Allow the student to show you what they can do. Um, and in this error-driven uh, teaching strategy of adaptation, it is not just the elimination of what doesn't work, but for the student, it becomes a recalibration of their, uh, of, of their overcoming their physical uh, barriers. So we as educators are always eliminating the things that don't work. But when a student has to recalibrate, we cannot exactly know how this makes sense to them. Wow, I, I thank you for that, Felicia. So um, I'm learning the difference between adapt versus modify. But Melinda, could you tell us more about what adaptive movements and mobility devices look like in instrumental music specifically? Yes, 
So adaptive movements for instrumental music um, can be thought of as clapping our hands. When I was coming up and, and learning an instrument, our band directors would say, okay, clap the rhythms, right? And so everybody had an opportunity to participate. But it, when you have a student with differing abilities, depending upon their uh, differing ability or the student's disability, you gotta make sure that the outcome of understanding, for example, the first one clapping using clapping to learn rhythmic reading with numbers and or syllables i want to try to get an understanding of how the student is processing it because the out the learning objective when a student wants to play an instrument of differing abilities or um just a student wants to play an instrument in general is that they have to come together to play in an ensemble so i need to make sure there's a good understanding of music theory basis, right? Rhythm reading, pitch reading, and, and getting around the facilities of your instrument. So say if a student has, um, has uh, a differing ability that uh, allows them to have a, a hearing device, and, and I've taught students with this, um, I make sure that I talk a little slower than I normally do. Like I, I normally when I get nervous, I, I speed up like I am now, but I have to make sure I calm myself down because I know they're also taking in the movement of my lips. So then I can demonstrate what I'm asking them to do. If a student um, doesn't have the ability to move one particular arm, they can tap their leg. Okay, so so clapping or tapping or even dancing, say if a student has a socio-emotional behavior disability and they have a lot of energy and if I'm doing teaching rhythms or if I'm teaching steady beat, I tell you what, let's get up, we can move. And a student who is ambulatory, meaning that their legs don't move, say if they're in a the wheelchair, can move at the pace of the steady beat. Like other like students who um, students who can who can walk without a device, they can march and the student that's in a wheelchair or on a cane or a walker can move at their pace as long as I can see that they understand the steady beat when I'm teaching tempo or time signature, or or like I said, um, teaching rhythm in whatever way that I that I need to. So those are adapting devices for uh, instrument. I mean, excuse me, yeah, adaptive movements for instrumental music. When it comes to mobility devices, that's when um, I need to go to labeling an instrument. So if, if, if that's needed, for example, um, like any other band director, they have phenomenal musicians and band directors in New Orleans, you make sure that the student picks an instrument that is best suited for their learning style. So if I have a student who um, is autistic and they're in a class with 15 other clarinet players, I'm, I'm going to label everyone's instrument so they know left from right, top from bottom but I may also ask their parents to purchase some earplugs for them so they're not overwhelmed by sound. Other things, um, like I said, with labeling, here we see a, a trumpet that has the keys label one, two, three. It, I just go ahead and label all students' instruments one, two, three, first piston, second piston, third piston, and then I'll put a L for left hand and R for right hand so students know where their hands should be should be going and in particular for students who have gross motor or fine motor disabilities this helps but i don't want to single out the student with a differing ability so every student gets this when they're learning how to play a trumpet for the first time i do the same concept for like i said clarinet but i do it in silver um permanent marker and i actually can use stickers color stickers for flute players so they know which specific keys to to use. Um, in Montgomery County, in Maryland, uh, instrumental music teachers can also teach orchestra. So um, an auto parts store is one of my favorite places to go get tools to help with mobility devices, right? So um, car pinstriping tape helps to label the fingerboard for violin, viola, and cello players. So they know the proper distance that they need to shape their left hand when they're playing their 
particular instrument. So this ensures success. But in Montgomery County, we are are, are trained to not actually um, to make sure that we're not going to the student with a disability and 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 just pointing you know this out okay you need this you need that so what we try to do is make all the students that are participating in that class receive the same startup benefit now for those of you who have children and you're renting instruments don't get upset that the permanent marker does come off the more they practice the more it rubs off so those are mobility devices in the instrumental music program for for Thank the majority you so much. Thank you so much, Melinda. So uh, I'm, I'm hearing about these different mobility devices, mm -hmm. but what does that look like with the differing abilities specifically? What are the adaptive movements that are paired with the different disabilities? What works best? So remember we were saying you have to know your students and you have to make sure that you you know, you know their strengths. Um, before they come into your classroom. It's, it's like, you know, forming a relationship with all the other students. So we do this with every other, all the other students that we teach as well. So you know the student's personality, you know their background, you know, you try to get understanding of what's going on at home. So for example, if I am teaching rhythm or, or tempo for students with attention deficit disorder, I'm gonna make sure to have the students to move to the beat and have the students count the beat out loud with me. So oftentimes, many students who have attention deficit disorder are auditory learners, so they, they're learning by ear. So it's great to make sure that everybody's on the same page by reciting the, the tempo speed at the, at the same time. So um, students with autism is very, it's very, very important that you use specific routines to prepare them to move. Now, with every student, it's just great to have great classroom management practices. They know what comes first, second, third, fourth, and fifth in your classroom before you start even teaching. So establishing relationships and establishing management practices are very important to, to ensure all students have success. For students who have visual impairment, you want to pair them with uh, another student so that they can get around the um, the classroom chairs or they can um, you can better assist them with another student and the student can say okay you know if you want you can tap the shoulders the students can make that decision dr uh, lively um, you can chime in at any point in time here because i don't want to i don't want to monopolize this particular uh, slide well this slide is just uh, uh pointing out or specific differing abilities and the way to adapt uh, your program to give students the ability to participate. So you as a teacher are helping the student meet the outcomes in the best way to suit them, such as the non-ambulatory uh, movements, uh, if, uh, use the arms, or the heads, or the hands. Um, in the case of, of learning impairment, use charts, use something that signals uh, in, in advance uh, what's about to happen. And and in uh, in and in in the case of uh, children with emotional disabilities, be sure you provide provide lots of space and a lot of positive reinforcement. But that is important for everyone. Absolutely. I know that's right. I agree. I agree. So we've learned. I feel, I feel like I've taken in so much about the adaptive movements and what works best for the different differing abilities. But um, I'm curious, Meredith, I would love to know what you have to say, what, that, what does that mean once we've taken this and adapted it into our instructional plan? What does it mean for the student's brain and body? What is this music and art doing for the student's brain and the body in the classroom? Yeah, that's a great question, Pam, and some really fascinating research out there. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself to our guests this evening. My name is Meredith Sharp and I am a Caucasian female of Northern European descent. I'm wearing a red shirt with flowers and my hair is pulled back in a bun. My Zoom background is the inside of Preservation Hall. And I am a neurologic music therapist and I work with students with disabilities in various settings, including schools. So as we can see from this image, many areas of the brain are stimulated as we listen to and create music. For the purposes of this webinar, we're gonna focus on those motor areas of the brain. 
So the motor cortex, which is located in the frontal lobe of the brain, helps us plan, control, and perform those voluntary movements used to play an instrument or move to music. We also see in this image the cerebellum, which is located towards the back at the top of the brainstem. As we play an instrument or move to music, the cerebellum helps us with balance, coordination, fine motor movements, and motor learning. So music directly accesses these motor areas of the brain. So when we take the time to create adaptive experiences for our students, we are helping them to actually optimize their brain function and be more successful. We can look further at how specific musical examples and elements can support adaptive movements as we go on to the next slide. So as we plan to use adaptive movements in the classroom, we can think about the different elements listed here, such as rhythm, tempo, melody, dynamics, and harmony, and then how each of these can be purposefully used to create and support adaptive movements. So for example, introducing a steady pulse at the right tempo for the student helps them entrain with the beat so that movements become more coordinated and organized. I've used this idea for students with cerebral palsy to improve their independent finger movement as they play individual piano keys to a metronome beat. So as the metronome beat taps, each finger is playing a key on the piano. And the really cool part about this is that this work has actually translated into improving the student's handwriting as well. So you see some carryover. Using a steady beat in this way has also helped several of my students with gross motor function and balance as they play drums in an alternating pattern on either side of the body. So going back and forth, which has been really great to see. I found that carefully using certain melodic patterns can stimulate certain movements. For example, I created a short composition for a student with cerebral palsy that consisted of an ascending melody. So a melody going up, with the appropriate tempo and meter to help her stand up independently. And with practice, this led to her being able to stand up independently and then she could move with her classmates, dance with her classmates, and it was really a lot of fun. Making the connection between certain body movements and dynamic levels in music has greatly helped my students with autism spectrum disorder to gain better motor control and motor planning. I'm currently working with one student to make the connection between smaller amounts of air through a harmonica means softer sounds, while larger amounts of air means louder sounds. We're hoping that these concrete connections will also help him be able to self-regulate so when he needs to speak louder or become softer to self-soothe. And lastly, I've used harmony and certain harmonic progressions to cue movements accent movements and celebrate movements. I worked with a student with multiple physical disabilities who lit up when I suspended that dominant chord as he worked to reach for an instrument. And then as he played the instrument, the progression resolved to the tonic or home note. So he felt that sense of completion and resolution and accomplishment. And that was really a lot of fun each time. So Pam, we can see how not only do adaptive movements help our students create the music, but the music itself can be an incredible tool in facilitating adaptive movements. Wow, Meredith, I, I would say so. Uh, it's definitely just learning all of this has got my motor centers going. So uh, speaking of harmony, Felicia, what would you say the, the positive effects of general vocal music education uh, does for the student's brain. Right. Well, uh, as you see here, a few quotes of, from some research on the effects of music study and, and rhythm entrainment on the brain. Um, there's an increase in fine motor skill. There is a regulation of emotions. There is more use of the brain stem, as Meredith uh, referred. Uh, and, uh, and there's a greater impact on cognitive functioning. So researchers have found that even uh, in adults, as they're given a difficult tasks to do, that they compensate, they use strategies to compensate, but they always um, uh, go to reach their uh, task completion in safety. And I know when our students are 
in class, they may uh, use their movement abilities in class, but they'll always try to maintain their emotional uh, safety. And we as teachers have to adapt to meet students' abilities to defend that emotional safety as well as their cognitive development. And we should always consider and understand the importance of using music in any educational setting and its effect on the child's intellect. Okay, so I remember Melinda shared some specific strategies with us for instrumental music. Felicia, could you share some strategies um, that, that apply to general vocal music education in the classroom? Certainly. Uh, most of us in general music, vocal music, um, are introduced to these various uh, uh, methodologies. Um, uh, sometimes uh, we adhere to one, or but most of us use uh, a combination of everything. But just so you know, the ORF approach is kind of a, an integrated arts uh, approach uh, using drama and movement and singing and playing um, those uh, xylophone type instruments that you see there in the picture. Dalcross uh, or Eurythmics uh, is is the only one that is mostly movement centric. Um, it begins with introducing concepts strictly through movement. Um, the Kodai uh, method is uh, of the principles to create a developmental program for um, for your music students. And the the movement component, uh, one of the movement components is the use of the John Kerwin hand signs. So it's the use of the hand signs to indicate the solfege uh, syllables in a scale. And they learn to, um, to read, to, they, they have ear training and learn to read music through that, uh, that process. The Gordon Music Learning Theory um, has some movement in the process of, of learning to read rhythm patterns. They move to the um, macro beat as they're reading these patterns and build a vocabulary so that they can move on to uh, improvisational skills later in the process. Uh, the Suzuki method is you know, very famous for uh, getting kids playing instruments um, pretty quickly. And although it is by ear, as they say, the movement component is that they are using their muscle memory to, um, to find the these melodies as they're playing. So um, if we move on to the next slide. Yes, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to hear how we bring this all together, Felicia. Um, you, if, if you want a lot of movement in your classroom, be sure to uh, have some open space. The, the environment should invite both free and organized movement. Um, I use the I like to set up my room this way so that the rug becomes a place to sit, to move freely, um, and um, uh, uh, of course safely inside their bubble space. I like the chairs to be there to help create uh, line formations or in and out movement, but uh, thing where they have to adhere to a certain um, a, a certain patterns um, and of course uh, the chairs themselves are their home base it gives them a chance to to be where they're supposed to be in our next slide um, just want to um, to share with you the uh, fluidity of music uh, music learning through movement uh, for Delcross it is moving of uh, after hearing to going to moving, feeling and sensing, uh, sensing where the music is going and to get those senses to develop uh, some uh, analyzing uh, processes. That, that is where I would think our non-musician teachers would kind of stop. Just use that as, uh, as a guide on how to develop a a movement lesson. The others from the, the last four lines, the analyzing the reading and the writing and improvising and performing, are, are the concepts that your teaching musicians would use and go forward with. 
So these movement adaptations um, may look like a, a wheelchair user who might use a scarf to, to uh, show the beat or pull for fluid movement. If a student has an impaired gait, Maybe you accept the fact that they get they get to that beat on every other step, but they are, you know, moving to the beat. And of course, our our uh, blind and low vision students may need someone to lend an arm, um, softly verbalize what's going to happen to the right, to the left. Um, in that case, also be sure that the chairs and the furniture is, is where it was the last time they were in the room. Uh, there are lots more adaptive movements um, listed here. Um, and, uh, you know, when you get a chance to go back over the uh, material here, you can get a chance maybe to make a checklist of the kinds of things that you want to use in your movement lesson so that everybody, everybody's able to participate. That is very poignant. I think that as an overthinker myself, I have to make a checklist. So I've got all of this wonderful information now, and I see Melinda laughing because I'm sure you can speak to it the same. We've got all this information, but Felicia, how, how can we plan to actually teach this in the classroom and deliver it to our students now that we've got all of these uh, wonderful gems from, from all of you? Well, as you're putting together that, that movement lesson, um, certainly consider where the, where the students were the last time you had a music class. Um, were they excited? Were they sad? Were they uh, fairly balanced emotionally? And, you know, you want to move on from there. Um, what kind of activity would keep encouraging in them to learn and carry and, and something that they can carry with them, they'll remember, they'll enjoy and remember. And of of course, uh, based on your lessons and activities, um, uh, the, determine beforehand who might have specific needs and how you are going to address them without drawing major attention to them. Um, can you address everybody and, um, uh, and approach it that way? Or can you maybe put the stereo close to the, the hard of hearing students seat so that they have that vibration to, to, uh, to lean on as they are moving through the, um, through the lesson. Okay, but what if I'm not a musician, Felicia? How do I do this? Well, you know, I really believe that if, that what you love uh, and show that you love, the students will also appreciate. So whatever genre of music, of American music you, you love or is important to you, is important to you, we want to pass it on to the students. Um, and you know, in New Orleans, it's, it's the origin of the music that has become our classical music. And the preservation of that is, is crucial to, for, to kids, for all the kids in the country, to know their history and their culture. So our uh, non-musicians uh, can do no more than just, just play uh, some recordings. Just be sure that this music is in the students' ears, uh, that they have a pleasant experience, and they continue to advocate for students of differing abilities just by adjusting your program so that they can participate. That is an advocation in itself. And of course, advocating for music program so that you know, the non-musicians non can pass it over to, to the, uh, the teaching musicians so that uh, they will have a complete and full program. And um, I advocate for programs that will enhance the cognitive development of our students. Well, I think that now is a great time for us to have our experiential. Could you tell us what um, we're about to do next? And this will be a great opportunity for everyone in the audience tonight to join in and apply uh, some of these great tips that Felicia, Meredith, and Melinda have shared with us. Well, I need you to do a couple of things. Uh, stay muted. I'm very experienced at this by now. <laughs> 
<laughs> we don't want to, everybody singing all the different times. But um, in this uh, this piece called Little Liza Jane, I, I just is one of my favorites. I use it often. I have used it many, many, many times over 40 years, probably 40 times. But um, it has a call and response form, which of course is uh, is a foundational form for American music. And um, I want you to 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 move on the response. Okay, let's, how does it go? You got to pick. You got to pick a, a different ability. You know, um, if let's pretend that that you don't have use of your legs, so you use your hands. I'm going to use my hands to to demonstrate and indicate to you when it's time to to uh, to move. Make a choice. Be ready. So the song goes like this. I got a house in Baltimore, and that's the call. And the refrain, oh, excuse me, the response is, Little Liza Jane, and that's where you're gonna move. You're gonna keep the beat. Panelists, would you please be, help, help me indicate to everybody when it's time to move. Little Liza Jane, streetcar runs right by my door. Little Liza Jane, oh, Eliza, Little Liza Jane. Oh, Eliza, little Eliza Jane. Okay, the band is in on it too. Well, we are so lucky. Pam, would you please introduce our band? Without further ado, I have Mr. Will Smith and the Preservation Ensemble performing Little Eliza Jane. Join in and have fun. <laughs> much for walking us through that. I really think I have a great idea of, of everything that we spoke about tonight. So, so what do you think our action steps should be? Well, if you want to do something tomorrow in your classroom uh, and you're a, a, a non-musician, a, a 
uh, in contained classroom teacher. Um, there are a few things you can do right away. First of all, be sure you use some of the recordings uh, by the Preservation Hall Band. And uh, maybe play this past the beat game. Uh, teaching musicians might actually use a rhythm pattern that the students pass. Um, uh, Non-musicians might just use a sound or a mood and you just pass it along and keep the beat that way. Uh, freeze dance is, and I'm sure you know what that is, is always a big go-to. Uh, name that song from the rhythm. If you have a group of songs that all the kids know, see if they can do a little guessing game. Somebody clap the rhythm, body percussion the rhythm, and see if they can hear from that. It's a great uh, brain teaser. Um, song lyric acting, use you have them, have, have them use their own um, movements and actions to act out the words of a song. And of course, adapt uh, some other games into music games, such as instrument charades. Wow, okay. That sounds like something I can do. Um, I'm really excited to, to, to spread the word about this. Meredith, you're here to tell us more about the adapti adaptations, excuse me, made to the Preservation Hall lessons. Can you tell us more about these le lesson adaptations? Yes, yes, we work to create some lesson adaptations for you all to use and access on the Preservation Hall website. They can be found in the K through eight lessons, as well as in the song specific lessons. For example, you see here, Lily of the Valley, so you can find them in those lessons. And then we also wanna ask you to keep an eye out for lesson adaptations by Dr. Felicia Lively that will be found on the Preservation blog and social media platforms. Wow, thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing those adaptations and we would love for everyone to keep following along. We'll be sharing all of these webinars through our blog and YouTube channel and we'll be adding new lessons with adaptations every month at our website, lessons.preshallfoundation.org slash lessons and webinars for the two specific things. I think I've done enough talking. How about we bring you all who have been so wonderful and participating. It was amazing to see your faces during the experiential. We'd love to open up the floor for a Q and A. Um, does anyone have any questions for our panelists this evening? We have uh, a few more minutes and would love to hear from you. And Melinda, Felicia, Meredith, just keep an eye on the chat box. And if you would like to directly engage with the audience, please do. And Will, I'm sorry, Will as well. <laughs> Last but certainly not least. Well, the, the, web, the webinar is, is excessively informal and excessively uh, uh, profound uh, to me uh, as, a, as a musician and music educator. I mean, to hear the preservation band do what they do, how they do what they do, um, um, just brought to mind that you know, when we're thinking music, um, one of the greatest exports of the United States to the world is our music and our culture. And for the, the people of New Orleans uh, and everybody, every citizen of the world to experience the pandemic that we have gone through and continue to play with such joy and such uh, uh, fervor is amazing. And that's what we need to heal as we are, are emerging out of this pandemic, right? You know, um, people, the human, humanity is, is, is a creative culture. And to continue to play uh, your instrument and or sing or to draw or to dance is part of the healing process. And it was when it relates to our students as we go back, because everybody's been traumatized in this pandemic, as we go back into our classrooms in whatever shape, form and fashion, to take that that joy and love of music with us. Now, if you are an educator and say, you're not sure the budget that you have, right? Because right? budget right. takes a lot, they, right. right? Right, so when I was talking about advocacy, one of the main reasons I was talking about advocacy was not only so students of differing abilities or disabilities can have access to what everybody else have access to, but so that you understand that your system gets money for every student that has a 504 and an IEP in your system. Now, Melinda, I hadn't heard anybody say anything specifically about that, true. 
<laughs> but, you, you know, I'm a fan of you have not because you ask not. If you need more aid to help your students be successful, to have the devices that they need to participate in the different um, um, academic subjects that they are, they are um, in, in participating in from an academic perspective, they're in, in inclusion classes with, say, if, if Mr. Smith um, needs more, more shakers or more things of that nature, um, um, in the resources, when you go back to Preservation Hall uh, website for the webinar, um, I've taken the liberty of putting some grants that you can apply for, right? Right. And so say, you know, everybody's taking a hit in this pandemic when it comes to education and music education. It's going to take a little effort, but it's worth it, right? So um, some grants, it depends on what they are, aren't all for instruments. Some are just for accessories. Now, for me in instrumental music, um, when we have students of differing abilities or students who just can't afford to play, um, we have some instruments for students, but they need supplies. So I know that Diodario has a grant for supplies. And sometimes it's just a matter of knowing information and having access to that information to ensure that your community, your school system, your students, your community group has what they need. Absolutely. And again, those resources will be available to everyone um, on our webinar recap. And um, we still have a few minutes here. If there's anyone else, let me check this uh, chat. Yes, I do agree that these grant recommendations are going to be very useful. And yet again, the reminder is that they will be available early next week on our Salon 726 um, website. So if there's no more questions, any more questions, I really love the participation tonight. Um, it was wonderful to have everyone watching live music again together, right? Thank you, Zoom, for that. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And please make sure to um, take these things into your classrooms, homes, dance troops, anywhere where you are wanting to be part of the human experience. We encourage you to take these tips with you wherever you go. And once again, on behalf of Preservation Hall, Preservation Hall Foundation, and all lovers of music and art, thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you.